uh, VIT Bhopal and uh, thanks a lot for giving us an opportunity to share our thoughts on the digital IP. Today's topic is very, you know, important from the semiconductor. Everybody is aware of, you know, nowadays the semiconductor is, you know, everybody is aware of semiconductor and, you know, everybody is interested in to enter into this one. So today's topic is very, very interesting as well as, uh, you know, from the semiconductor uh, stuff, but also this is the core work uh, which is, you know, required uh, for uh, designing any SOC. So with this, uh, you know, uh, I thank you, Dr. Devashi Sadikari, uh, Professor Dr. Devashi Sadikari for, you know, uh, supporting us on this. Thank you, sir, uh, for giving us an opportunity to present this uh, to your college. Uh, your college students will be, you know, uh, learn a lot of stuff with this one. And uh, we are, you know, continuously uh, doing this on a regular basis. On every first Tuesday, you know, every month, first Tuesday every month, we are going to share, you know, topic related to the uh, VLSI. And on third Tuesday every month, we are, you know, uh, picking the topic from system engineering, which includes application engineering, which includes system engineering, which includes software engineering, and all those topics. So today, as it is first, you know, uh, uh, Tuesday of August, and uh, today's topic is digital IP. So before jumping on to the real topic, uh, uh, sir, if you can, you know, uh, share some suggestions for semiconductor industry, how, you know, we can extend support to the uh, university students or, or any other innovative suggestions for us. So over to you, sir. Very good afternoon to Dr. Prabhjot, uh, Mr. Manish. Uh, Mr. Ashish, uh, and I believe uh, Ms. Jalak Gupta would also be here. Uh, very good afternoon to all of you. And I am uh, really excited that uh, you have chosen us uh, to interact with our students. Uh, you were talking about VLSI, but I was going through your uh, website and I found certain things very interesting. Uh, uh, like uh, there is an application for you in the domain of radar systems, uh, as well as I believe you are also working in the physical layer of uh, uh, sub 6 uh, gigahertz to 40 gigahertz. And uh, it's very interesting. Uh, that means uh, uh, also you mentioned about, I think your website mentions about uh, uh, around one kilowatt of power output. That means uh, you are well into your uh, millimetric wave massive MIMO systems, uh, as well as uh, the radar systems. Uh, I have worked in radar for 14 years, uh, missile guidance radars in the Air Force, uh, and also worked in uh, wireless communication systems. And you'll be pleased to note uh, that our students, our course curriculum includes all these topics, uh, Right now, they have uh, the undergraduate students. They have gone up to uh, the initial digital communication and analog communication part, and uh, signals and systems. All those, uh, which are standard courses that uh, is followed everywhere. Uh, and uh, we are definitely giving a very important thrust uh, to the VLSI domain, as well as MS embedded systems and IoT, and uh, our. Post-graduation specialization is in VLSI, and uh, we are very well equipped with uh, good human resource, uh, very good faculties, and we are improving our human resource further by uh, including much more qualified faculties. So uh, I should say that uh, all of us are quite qualified enough. And uh, we are having a good collaboration with IIT Indoor uh, as far as uh, this uh, uh, project collaboration is concerned uh, regarding VLSI and embedded systems. Uh, we have good software. We are in the uh, procurement process of Cadence. Uh, and as well, we already have IntelliSuite. Our course curriculum uh, goes around uh, analog and digital VLSI for the postgraduate students, as well as ASCII design and FPGA-based designs. 
so well into this game and uh, i am very confident that our students would do very well in this area uh, both the undergraduate as well as postgraduate like i said in the start uh, that i was impressed with your communication part we have very good students who understands very nicely about the physical layer concepts so uh, you uh, it will be very good if you can give certain opportunities in that area in that domain also uh, like wireless systems uh, with mimo and massive mimo systems and uh, i am again grateful to all of you to uh, provide a chance to our students to interact with them and thank you so much thank you once again uh, you will get all sort of support from our side uh, that is guaranteed and whatever uh, uh, whatever suggestions you make we will go ahead with those suggestions to tweak the syllabus or tweak uh, whatever is possible uh, as per your requirement and uh, that's it from my side thank you thanks a lot to all of you thank you yeah thanks a lot uh, professor dr devashish adhikari you know uh, i just you know uh, learned about you that uh, you have a very rich experience from indian air force uh, you know working on this uh, all radar and missiles and all thank you first of all for all your services to the nation and yes uh, you are also you know sharing those experience with the students uh, you know as a faculty member uh, in the in this organization so thanks a lot for all those things but yes uh, nxp is also you know world leader in automotive uh, radar uh, applications not just 66 but also 77 gigahertz also we have and uh, this is mainly you know uh, we are developing all these applications uh, for uh, uh, automobile uh, Uh, architectures and all so with this yeah uh, for sure you know we are going to collaborate uh, on this topic uh, and ashish ji is the single point of contact from nxp india side uh, you know he can coordinate with you and we can see how we can you know jointly do some research uh, project uh, on this topic very interesting topic yes. and yes. it is you know uh, it's a life related also because uh, you know nowadays you know more than 8 radars are mounted on the car to do all you know uh, adas related uh, uh, activities and how we can you know uh, zero accident is the uh, nxp policy whenever we are designing zero emission and zero you know accidents that's our uh, uh, highest priority uh, task which we are all working on for sure we are going to work together on this one yeah ashish ji uh, yeah, can you uh, share Vishy, your you know how nxp uh, india management team is going to you know support on this when your views on that on this yeah i i will certainly uh, uh, manage uh, but first of all thank you for you know because i uh, dr adhikari my name is ashish mittal and i am a spoke person from nxp to the vit universities all campuses including so i mean we started first with vit bellore and i would like thank uh, manish to you know help me to ensure that all vit campus is connecting and all the staff we have here that i am very thankful to manish to you and and subjit that we are doing very good job on the vit sites so many many thanks from my side and uh, and coming to the dr adhikari uh, the idea the nxp is doing very many many things in the university side nxp campus connect is just one thing and there are many things we are doing it and uh, we can discuss in details and we have many thing where we can give our knowledge we can enhance your skills there are many thing we can discuss with you we, we are going to start something with vit also vit vellore and uh, this is the third nsp uh, campus connect uh, and before we had with the vit vellore and vit uh, chennai and next will also be hope i'm i'm expecting to be the vit hyderabad so uh, this is a very good collaboration from nsp and this vit university and we i'm seeing very good synergy and we will move it in the interest of the student in the interest of nsp in the interest of uh, uh, nation thank you Uh, you uh, you can reach adhikari dr adhikari any time with me on anything you need help from nxp thank you thank you so much yeah ashish ji thank you and we have to take this you know uh, relationship to the next level let's see how jointly we can work together and you know uh, how we can share new technologies and introduce all these things into the vit campuses and we can support thank students you. and all so thank, thank you, you ashish ji for all your you know uh, smart work please continue with us 
thank you so with thank this you. you know uh, now we you know presenters are already visible today's topic is already visible on the screen digital ip so digital ip you know i don't want to go into this one but yes uh, we have two experts visible here mr prabhjot singh who is our technical director he is having you know 19 plus years of industry experience in you know wide variety like ip architecture design in radar signal processing your you know expertise are also aligned with the uh, professor dr devasis adhikari so it's a very interesting you know uh, for them also and then uh, high speed uh, you know interfaces like pci which is you know nowadays uh, uh, using in the high end cars hypervisors and a lot of stuff is going on then plus uh, flash sd car controller so he is an expert you know from uh, mainly communication networking wireless domain accelerator so he is going to you know thank you prabhjot and welcome to this uh, platform and uh, students are going to learn together with you today next is uh, you know jhala gupta visible on the screen uh, she is our you know principal design engineer and expert from the digital ip team uh, you know uh, with wide variety of experience from the microcontrollers and microprocessor architecture and all and uh, you know uh, c is playing a key role in our uh, ip and subsystem verification for automotive applications and all so very experts having you know wide variety of experiences so over to you prabhjot singh uh, take it you know from here and uh, share uh, your experience with these students yeah thank you thank you manish and thanks uh, ashish for the kind words uh, uh, just just uh, one, one minute uh, i want to add one thing manish uh, this is the manifest for the the vit uh, bhopal we have a two best of the expert the both belongs to my team the prabhjot oh. is a very very high highly reputed itl designer and jalak is also working with me and she is a very highly reputed verification engineer what what is my uh you know observation from last two is that we don't make it interactive you just listen it you note down your question and after we complete with one hour this is very important that you talk to these guys talk to these experts and uh, you know get your answer answer you know question queries answered so use this time for your skill this must be interactive Thank yeah you. yeah so uh, uh, i think uh, uh... discipline is also very important and i thank you for your suggestion ashish ji so what we can do is uh, we can suggest you to type your query immediately on the chat box whatever yes. you know queries you have so we have two experts they can you know online help you immediately through the chat box or once we finish the presentation you can ask your queries uh, uh, lively so that way we yes. can you know uh, finish our uh, presentation as well as we can share our thoughts on this one with this you should note uh, yeah you should note down the uh, question over yeah. to you please yeah. go ahead please yeah. go ahead. thanks thanks manish and thanks ashish for uh, these kind suggestions uh, i think the students have already noted down it and it they will uh, do so uh, thank you vit bhopal for uh, giving us opportunity to talk on uh, for this session today uh, so the uh, uh, the topic of today's session is digital ip an overview of design and verification flow so on this topic uh, i'm prachod singh as already mentioned by ash uh, uh, by manish i'm uh, working on the design side and uh, jhalak uh, along with me she is uh, handling the verification domain so we will try to go over uh, these two domains together uh, along with you um, as you know in the, in a digital design flows uh, there was a time that uh, the designs was very small and there are uh, uh, logics which can be simply created Uh, by using gates or the flip flop designs uh, but now with the advancement in in technology nodes uh, and as well as the edf flows uh, the design has become very complex and um, um, so that and you can uh, basically introduced uh, complex uh, digital signal processing or com, uh, convolutional neural network uh, algorithm onto the onto the hdl codes or into the verilog codes so with this advancements in, in in the technology it is very important uh, to understand the challenges and uh, the the des new design flows or processes which needs to be followed so that the design once it is released to soc or once the silicon is fabricated out of it uh, is is bug free or it can be used uh, uh, at a, at a successful rate at the at the application level uh, with this note i'll i'll uh, jump to the next slide 
Yeah, so uh, digital IP. So what we understand from digital IP, uh, most of uh, the students in, in college times have learned about uh, the concepts of uh, uh, AND gates uh, and uh, sequential logic like the flip-flops or latches. And also they understood the timing diagrams, how the state machines needs to be coded or needs to be functioned, right? So digital IP is, is the uh, designs which consist of all these components and it can be coded or written into some sort of high level uh, description language like Verilog or DHDL. So why we call them digital IP? Because they process the information in the form of uh, bits, uh, zeros or ones, and they uh, provide the output also in the form of binary outputs. Uh, and the, uh, uh, these uh, HDL codes can be mapped into uh, your standard cells, uh, and NAND gates or gates or the flip-flops which are available from standard libraries. So let's start with the, uh, with the story of a, uh, of a college student who has understand this concept of digital design. He's confident of designing or creating the digital designs like small FIFOs or FSM logic or cloud logic, right? So now he, he wants to understand or explore more on in, into the VLSI industry. And when he enters the VLSI industry, he comes up with different new terms. Um, for example, the DFT design for test, uh, then there are STA static timing analysis, uh, then there are CDC clock domain crossings or performance or specifications. So all these terms uh, needs to be used or needs to be explained, uh, needs to be used at, at his day-to-day -day life uh, to create or to work on a digital IP domain. Uh, so he, uh, so in this session, we are trying to explain you all a bit about these terms and correlate with uh, with the design and the verification flow of of an digital IP. So with this uh, background in mind, uh, let's cover what we are uh, going to cover in the agenda today. Uh, we'll start with uh, digital IP, which are the building blocks of any SOC. What are the different types or functionality of a digital IP? Then what is the typical block diagram of any digital IP? Then after that, we will cover uh, the design and the verification flow for a typical digital IP. And then the example portfolio, uh, which Annex P kindly, uh, currently has on different digital IP uh, designs, followed up with uh, conclusion and the Q&A. Now let's start with, uh, with the applications uh, if you have, uh, as you, uh, as uh, professors are also mentioned, NXP is working uh, very heavily on the automotive applications like the radar sensing uh, or uh, uh, or other uh, ADAS uh, applications. Uh, so with these applications, uh, for example, if you have a uh, radar sensor on, uh, which which is available in the car, uh, which can be used to detect uh, or to assist the parking assist uh, application, in which the radar sensor can be uh, can guide or alarm the the driver whenever it sees any obstacle very near to the to the car right so if you open up these uh, uh, automotive devices uh, you will see certain form of uh, psbs uh, pcbs uh, which are nothing but your printed circuit boards uh, which are available in the electronic control units of the car and if we look closer into these uh, pcbs uh, there are certain integrated circuits uh, called ICs, which are connected together uh, with other components on the PCBs. And if we just peeled off the upper layer of the integrated circuit, uh, then you will see some sort of uh, uh, this picture uh, in uh, where the silicon die is in the center and it is connected to the periphery using the wire bonds. And uh, so now if we look at further into the uh, into the silicon die. So uh, this is how the typical day, uh, die layout would look like uh, where it consists of uh, different uh, uh, design blocks like cores, your memory systems, uh, your uh, um, uh, external interfaces uh, or any other accelerator or any hard IPs uh, which are available uh, for, uh, for integrating or uh, interfacing with the external world. So with this uh, design or the SOC picture in mind, <clears throat> if 
if we start with what is what is an ip right so ip uh, normally stands for intellectual property which is although a very generic term uh, it can be used for anything which has been patented or uh, novel in, in any any domain for example there can be ips on on in the software domain there can be ips in the in the medical uh, area also uh, but in context of vlsi if i look at uh, ip blocks are nothing but your design blocks which are basic uh, building blocks of any complex soc and which can be reused across different socs to create different applications so to understand it further uh, let's take an analogy of any ip block with with uh, lego blocks which are available in in different shapes or kinds and you can connect these lego blocks to create different structures or shapes like any hospital or building or any any other uh, model for for school etc so if i look at those lego blocks in in closer uh, then uh, you can find the find out that there are certain characteristics those lego blocks have which makes them uh, uh, successful in in creating those complex structures uh, the few of them are they should be uh, uh, they should be standard in size and such that so that they can when they combine with other lego blocks they should be able to create a uh, different structures in it and they should also support standard interfaces so that it is easy to interconnect with other blocks uh, and help them the integration uh, and reduce the time of integration so similarly uh, if we look at the, what are the different prerequisites for any digital ip block the first one which comes to our mind is the design reuse as i already talk about uh, the ip blocks should be created in such a way that it should be reused across multiple applications for example if we have a ethernet controller ip and um, uh, it should be usable in in the uh, low end devices like the edge device and whereas also it should be reused we should be able to reuse those uh, ips at the at a very high end like the server uh, uh, where multiple data streams are are combining together so to make sure that the ip blocks are reusable across different uh, platforms or different applications we normally <clears throat> parameterize or bound those ips with with parameters and uh, which helps them to optimize as well as make them reusable across different applications then the second uh, characteristics which any ip block should have is is it should be easy portable that means that the same ip block i should be able to take from one soc and should be able to integrate into other soc into different technology nodes with different me uh, design methodologies and they should be seamless integrated into the different applications the third one which is also important for for any ip is to support standard interfaces so if we have a ip with standard interfaces that can be easily plugged into an soc and and can help create a complex soc structures uh, which can be which can service the required applications now if i look at what are the different kinds of ips generally we have uh, there could be some ips which we which are uh, defined new for for any application or for any soc um, and there would be some existing ips where we are modifying them or updating them or reusing across different or uh, in a particular soc and then the third category is that there will be some ips we are procuring from outside uh, vendors uh, to uh, to uh, reduce the time to market so if we take all these ips uh, the first Uh, we have to perform is the ip sign off which are nothing but the basic design checks um, to ensure that the quality of an ip is is robust and it should help in making the first time right soc integration so once the ip sign off has been completed uh, then the soc takes uh, those ips into their flow integrate them and run their uh, uh, run their sign off checks before it can be passed on uh, to the other teams who are actually working on implementing and creating layouts out of those uh, design or the digital ips 
So in parallel to these process, uh, the, the next step which is running is the validation or the verification of these IPs. So at every stage, we have to ensure that the IP is robust and bug free and there are different, it, it is verified or validated at different scenarios uh, uh, to ensure uh, that it is not only uh, it, it is uh, uh, it is meeting the criteria of the uh, of the requirement, but also it is it is the use cases uh, which the systems has been designed for has been validated or tested on on those uh, SOC or pre silicon validation. So we will cover these uh, sign off checks uh, in the in the later uh, slides. Now, once we understand that what is an IP or what is an digital IP, now let's look at why we need an IP. As I already talked about, uh, first of all, the IP, the first need or the foremost need of an IP is that it should be reused across different applications and uh, it will help in reduce the time to market so that SOC can take the on, on the shelf IPs and integrate them, create their applications and ship it to market for to the customer right so uh, with having these ips in a uh, in a standalone fashion we can test them in a fpga uh, design which is in the pre silicon and this will help not only test the ip but also it will give platform for software and for your uh, uh, firmwares to be developed in parallel or in conjunction with the ip design or with the soc designs so it also helps in reducing the complexity of an uh, of a very big SOC. If we partition an SOC into a smaller chunk of IPs, then the SOC integration needs to focus mainly on how these IPs interact with each other, rather than focusing mainly on the uh, on the IP uh, issues or IP uh, functionality. So by having an IP designs uh, uh, as a standalone, it not only offers the flexibility. Uh, to basically uh, develop these IPs in as uh, as a separate from from the SOC timelines. These these IPs can be developed before the SOCs, and these can be tested uh, before the SOC work even started. So since we uh, we all, along with IP development, we also develop the test bench or verifications uh, environment along with the standalone IP. So it helps us in finding the bugs. Uh, easy in the design flow because we are having more control on the on the verification system uh, when we tested it them into a uh, into a very uh, simple standalone uh, environment. For example, if I have an FIFO design and I want to test the overflow or underflow condition of that I, uh, FIFO, it is very easy to test it on a standalone IP level rather than finding those complex scenarios. Or simulating those complex scenarios into 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 SOC sub or subsystem level where it might be very difficult or sometimes even impossible to recreate those scenarios. Last but not the least, sometimes uh, we want that the IP or the uh, the logic should be protected from uh, uh, should be available in a protected form. We don't want to share the information uh, with with other teams. So in that case, the IP team can create some sort of hard IPs or encrypted IPs, uh, which can be delivered to those teams. Now, as we understand wh why we need an IP, let's look at what are the different types of IP blocks which are available in industry or in, in NXT as, as, a, as a general. Uh, there are two types of IPs available. First one is the soft IPs and second one is the hard IPs. So what do you mean by soft IP? Soft IP is an IP which is coded in the form of either HDL code or it is available in the form of netlist. So SOC can use these IPs, uh, create their own placement and routings uh, and the layouts and it can be uh, uh, it can be customized to any technology nodes as per the need of the SOC. Whereas in case of hard IPs, um, the hard IPs are generally available in, in a hard uh, boundary shape or hard hardened form. Uh, we cannot change uh, the, the layout of those IPs. They, those are less portable 
uh, than the than the upper uh, category and it cannot be customized based on a different technology nodes so some example of hard ips are your mixed signal ips like serial serializer deserializer pll blocks adcs analog to digital converter or digital to analog converters okay so as i talk about earlier ip is basically the building block of any complex soc now let's have a look at the, one of the typical soc how it looks like uh, in in general and we'll try to correlate with respect to uh, your human body how it is functioning and behaving for example in 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 this uh, soc if you can see on the top there are multiple or couple of cores available which can have their uh, own caches or memory management units um, so you can correlate to these cores uh, with with the brain of your body which is actually controlling uh, the complete body and other uh, functioning of the body so similarly the cores and the software running on these cores are actually controlling the different peripherals and the other uh, systems available in in this soc uh, apart from these cores there can be uh, dma blocks uh, which are used for data transfer from one memory region to another you can correlate to uh, correlate these dma blocks to your heart of the body which is actually uh, pumping out uh, blood from uh, from uh, two different parts of the body. So in similar way, the DMA blocks are uh, sharing or uh, carrying the information from one part to the one region to another region. In the middle, there are crossbars. Uh, so it is basically nothing, but they are sharing the information from one. Uh, they are transporting the information from one uh, IP block to another IP block. You can uh, think of it as as your blood vessels in the body which are actually transporting blood to different organs in, in, in your body. And in the bottom, there are certain peripheral blocks which we are showing, uh, which can be used to uh, sense the information from the external world or uh, send the control information out. Also, there can be some peripherals which are controlling the functioning of, uh, of this uh, SOC. So you can correlate to uh, these peripherals to your uh, other body parts like uh, eyes, uh, ears, or arms, which are actually helping us uh, doing different functions uh, for our day to day work. Now, after understanding how the typical uh, SOC looks like, now shift our focus uh, back to how the IP blocks uh, are designed or how the IP block is. Uh, will look like in general or in a typical manner, right? So uh, normally any IP block uh, basically have the clocks and resets. Uh, these will be supplied to all the sequential logics to uh, to pre uh, create or to sample the data and to reset those flops. Then there is a IP configuration bus, which is helping the I, uh, which is basically providing an interface through which uh, the IP block can be configured from outside world. And then there are certain IP data paths which are helping the IP to get the data from the external uh, memory spaces or the uh, other location memory targets and then uh, process the information and then sends back the data onto the uh, different memory targets. And there will be certain uh, chip interfaces uh, which will help the IP block to interact to the external world uh, or external ICs which are available on the PCBs. So the, apart from these, there can be certain miscellaneous signals or uh, control and interrupt information, which helps this IP blocks to get integrated uh, into a uh, into a complete uh, SOC. Now, if we look inside an IP, uh, what sort of structures are available within a, a, a typical IP? First one which comes to our mind are the control and the status registers. So as these IP configuration buses are connected to an IP, so those are actually used to read or, or access these control and status registers. These are nothing, the control registers are used to control the different functionalities of an IP. And then the status, uh, status registers 
uh, are used to get the status information of our uh, of an IP or any particular task which the IP is running on uh, can be accessed uh, by by the software using these status registers. Then uh, in IP blocks, uh, no, certainly we have certain state machines uh, which helps. Uh, basically, you can think of that uh, if an IP block is doing a particular function and that function needs certain steps to be followed, then normally we code those steps as part of state machines and their transitions. Uh, it helps in, uh, in creating those uh, uh, or stitching out different steps into a, uh, into a complete function. And then there will be certain logics apart from these state machines which are helping the IP block to process the data and create the uh, desired results out of it. Okay. Now we understand that how the IP typical IP blocks look like. Uh, now we will move on to how the digital IP execution flows works in NXP or in industry in general. So before we jump into that, let's understand why we need an IP execution flow. As I talked about earlier, the, the, with the increase in complexity of any IP, it is very important that we should follow the standard guidelines or standard uh, uh, practices and the processes to ensure that the, the IP which we are creating are first time right and results into zero defect at, at silicon level. To achieve that goal, uh, there are uh, certain execution flows which we follow in NXP and in general in, in industry as well. Uh, so the first one is that once the, it has been approved or it has been requested that there is, there is a need for an IP, the uh, systems teams or architecture teams define the macro requirements at a, uh, for an, a particular IP which defines those requirements at a very high level. Then IP architecture team along with other team members create the detailed architecture definition for, uh, for, uh, for an IP which satisfies those macro requirements. So in parallel, the verification or the validation teams start thinking about the verification architecture or the pre silicon strategy or the architecture which needs to be followed for verifying or validating those IPs. Once we create this uh, uh, architecture definition for a particular IP, then the next step is to convert those architecture definition into RTL codes or HDL code, which can be then further synthesized at uh, or integrated at the SOC level uh, to create the SOC implementation. So in parallel, the verification team start building upon their standalone test bench, stimuluses, checkers, and monitors, and, and also the pre-silicon validation team do so uh, uh, for their FPGA platform. Once the RTL design or the Verilog code is ready, then uh, as, I, as I discussed earlier, there are certain IP sign-off checks, which has to be run or followed at an IP level to ensure that the quality of an IP is, uh, is maintained and, and the structure is is uh, is any uh, is defect free so these are certain uh, checks which we follow first one is the link check and followed by cdc synthesis and dft so we will talk about these uh, checks in later slides in more detail so similarly the verification team uh, in parallel run the functional verification flow and test or uh, hunting do the bug hunting in the design and ensure that the complete design has been fully verified at, or validated at a standalone level before we ship it to, uh, to SOC for their integration. Apart from uh, these checks, uh, there are certain performance, power, and area requirements which we also need to adhere to during the IP execution flow. As we discussed in the previous slide, 
uh, from the architecture team, we get the micro architecture uh, requirements for, for a particular uh, IP block. Then IP design team or the architecture teams create the uh, detailed architecture definition, uh, which includes definition for all the interfaces, all the state machines, all the registers, which, which will be providing as a, uh, which will provide a software view of, of that IP to the, to the software. And, uh, and then the RTL design or the coding work uh, starts uh, in, in uh, for, for that particular IP. So now we will look into detail of uh, each and every step of uh, these sign off checks, uh, which we run at, a, at IP level um, and try to understand a, uh, a bit on, on those checks. So first one, uh, as I discussed already, uh, once we understand the, the requirements, the next step is to basically create the architecture or the micro architecture definition for those requirements. Uh, and then uh, which uh, basically provides information about all the state machines, the your register sections, interfaces, uh, which will completely define the IP as a, as a whole. Once we understand or define these, uh, these things for a particular design block, then we start the RTL coding uh, or the HDL coding, uh, where we ensure that whatever we are coding is uh, is as per the uh, the valid syntax of a particular Verilog language or a digital language, right? So that conversion uh, is is then done by. Uh, uh, so these processes are all manual, um, and normally we for uh, documenting the microarchitecture stuff or the documenting the uh, other information about the IPs, we use certain um, uh, um, documentations like uh, the register models, or which we will talk about later, and then certain other uh, documents. Mm. So now let's look at uh, what are the different register models. So as I uh, as I talk about earlier, uh, any typical IP has certain registers uh, available, which can uh, which you can think of as a as an interface from the uh, which can be used by software to interact to that IP. So these registers are generally memory mapped in a particular SOC or in a, in a system and through which uh, the software can write or read from from these registers. So typically there are certain sets of control registers available for a particular IP which helps in controlling the functionality of an IP and then uh, there will be some status registers which help the software to read out certain status uh, of a particular IP in which state it is or what is the result of a particular job which the IP is executing upon. So once all the um, uh, uh, these definitions are defined in, in, the, in the documentation, the RTL and the RTL code has been uh, uh, the, the the microarchitecture has been converted to HDL code. Uh, then we uh, also have to ensure that in the HDL, in the HDL code, the designs are uh, modularized in, in such a way that the sub blocks or the different partitions of an IP can be reused across different uh, 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 different IPs or at uh, at different applications. We can reuse those blocks. Sorry. Once the RTL code or the HDL length, uh, the HDL code is available, then first step which normally we perform is the link check. So what is link check? Links are basically uh, your, um, you can think of them as a syntax uh, check for the RTL code uh, in which uh, we verify that or we validate that the RTL code which we, are, which we have written is compliant to the uh, language uh, LRM, a uh, language uh, requirement, and as well as it is aligning to the best practices and the coding guidelines, which normally every company has uh, in, in their system. So how do we do those link, link checks? Uh, those are uh, performed by uh, certain tools like HAL or Spyglass. Uh, every EDA company has provided their own set of uh, link checks, uh, link tools, 
and the input to these tools are apart from the RTL, uh, you can provide them the design constraints in the form of clocks, resets, as well as the other rules or policy files based on which you want to do these perform these lint checks. So the output of this uh, lint check are in the form of errors and warnings, which design team needs to review and dispose of by either by changing the design or uh, by talking to the to the tool vendor and understanding what is the uh, whether those can be waived or not. And then once all the errors and warnings has been cleaned up, then the RTLA is ready for the next stage. Okay, so once the link checks has been cleaned up, uh, we normally uh, do the does the clock domain crossing checks. So what is clock domain crossing? So in many IPs, there are multiple clock domains uh, uh, on which that IP is working upon. And whenever the data is flowing from one clock domain to another clock domain, there is a possibility that the destination flop, uh, the flop which is working on the destination clock can go into metastable state or there can be result of uh, uh, data loss at the, at the destination. So to avoid these, uh, 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 these errors or these conditions, uh, designer normally put the uh, clock domain crossing uh, uh, structures like uh, multi-flop uh, designs or there are asynchronous FIFOs which can be used or a MUX synchronizers can be used. And, and uh, uh, in, in this check, we try to validate and verify that all the structures, required structures on the CDC path or the cloud domain crossing path has been in place and there is no uh, metastability condition or no data loss which can be observed at the IP level. For this check, um, again, there are certain tools like Spyglass, Questa, which can be used. And uh, apart from RTL code, uh, we need to provide them certain uh, information about the clocks and the resets. And also, it is important to give the I.O. constraints, which means that all our input output of an IP needs to be uh, defined as uh, or needs to be correlated to, to those clocks and resets. As an output, the tool provides all the uh, structural errors and warnings uh, for the structure and the functional CDC checks. And then the designer needs to review those errors and either fix the designs or, uh, or uh, uh, update the constraints accordingly. Apart from the CDC, the, the next check, uh, which is important for any particular IP design flow, is the synthesis check. In this synthesis check, what we are trying to do is basically, we have written our RTL code in the form of HTL language. Then uh, to, uh, to implement it into a tie or in a, in a silicon, we need to convert them into a gate level netlist, which is nothing but the, uh, the gate level view of, of that particular HTL code. And then this information can be further pass on to the implementation team, which can convert them into uh, transistors and the layouts uh, and other stuffs. So apart from this, the design compiler or any, any particular synthesis tool also generate reports for area, timing, and power. And this can be used uh, as, a, uh, as, a, as a check for uh, whether we are meeting those requirements which we have set during the requirement stage. So in this uh, synthesis flow, uh, it is also uh, checked whether the, there is any um, uh, any uh, any issues or related to synthesis or timing uh, in in the uh, during the uh, during the implementation. To do the uh, timing check, uh, there is a separate uh, uh, static timing analysis check uh, in which uh, basically it takes that netlist which has been generated from the synthesis tools and checks for all the setup and hold uh, uh, checks at the at a different IP nodes or at different flops and ensure that at none of the IP nodes uh, the setup or hold uh, checks are failing and then uh, then only 
uh, different uh, corner conditions which are available for that technology. So then only we can use that IP for a particular technology. Now. So apart from this uh, static analysis uh, or checks, uh, there is a one more important uh, check which uh, IP flows or IP design flow needs to run uh, is the design for testability. In uh, um, as as I already discussed, the complexity of the design has increased many folds uh, from the past, and so there is a need to insert or to put some designs which can be used to check the uh, the manufacturing faults in in the design. So, uh, for example, uh, if you want to test for uh, uh, for a stuck at fault or the uh, for any uh, manufacturing defect in the in the design, uh, what we need to do is basically let's say take a, uh, let's to look at the typical example of any design which has multiple flops in it and uh, after the flops, there are certain combination logic and they are providing the output to the next stage. To make it uh, DFT compliant or to ensure that uh, the design can be test after the manufacturing for all the defects, we put certain uh, uh, additional logic on top of the normal uh, uh, blocks or the design uh, structures. And in, in this, uh, in on a particular on every flop, uh, there will be two new nodes or two new inputs which have been introduced. One is the scan data in, and second one is the scan enable. So we'll try to understand how these scan enable or scan data works in a, in a typical fashion. So if you see, um, whenever we enable the scan mode, uh, or you can say uh, the the design is put into a scan uh, uh, mode, then the particular defined predefined data can be insert or shift in into a uh, into a flop and then every flop is connected uh, or basically the first the queue of first flop is connected to the scan data of the next flop so in this way we are trying to create a scan chains in which we stitch all the available design flops and put them into a uh, into a long long scan chains and using those scan chains, predefined data can be insert into these flops uh, in the in the scan mode. And then uh, to test these uh, nodes, what we do is we put the design again into functional mode, and the uh, and the data is is then uh, after the next cycle, the data will be captured in the next nodes. So. Uh, from those next nodes, we can shift out the data using these again these same scan chains. We can read out the uh, the information out, and then comparing it with the expected results, we can find out whether there is any defect uh, manufacturing defect uh, available or present in the design on a particular silicon die or not. So as we understand uh, the the DFT part, um, uh, so there is a specialized team who works on uh, doing these checks or inserting this uh, DFT logic in the in a, in a complete SOC. But from a design IP perspective, we also need to make sure that the design is compliant uh, or uh, to the DFT methodologies or to the DFT structures in such a way that all the nodes of the design whether it's a combinational logic or whether it's a flip-flop, every nodes are controllable and observable from a, from a DFT standpoint of view. And in this check, we try to find out if there is any weakness or what sort of DFT coverage we can achieve if we uh, put this design into, uh, into a DFT uh, scan chains or other uh, DFT logics has been inserted onto this uh, IP. And what kind of uh, coverage we can get from from that uh, uh, from that design? So the tool normally we use are the uh, Spyglass or the uh, FastScan or Tetramax. So uh, apart from the RTL, it takes the DFT rule files along with the uh, uh, constraint files and provides you the results in the form of uh, 
errors and warnings apart from the coverage uh, uh, you can get the stuckat or the transition coverage from uh, from these tools which will help you uh, understand how much uh, or how well your design is with respect to all those dft structures So with this, um, uh, I have covered most of the design checks. Uh, so uh, as we discussed earlier, apart from these design checks, verification team is working on or creating their own test bench at a IP standalone level and to ensure that uh, the IPs are functionally uh, working properly and meeting all the requirements. Uh, we run all the simulations and other FPGA stuff. Uh, I'll, I'll hand over to Jhalak to cover uh, uh, those uh, verification flows. Uh, hello, everyone. A very good evening to all. So uh, till now, uh, Prabhjot has already covered that what the digital IP is and you know, what kind of IPs are um, there in market or in our industry. And uh, they have already done a number of checks in design flow. So you can see from here is uh, that I'll be covering the uh, topic of IP verification. So the question might rise in your mind that there are a number of checks that has already been covered in digital design. Then why do we need IP verification on top of that? But basically, uh, IP verification is a mandatory step that is actually ensuring your IP is meeting all the functional uh, criteria or all the operational requirements that has been written or that has been provided to you at the beginning of your project cycle. The first step where the requirements were uh, discussed and freeze for any SOC. The second point uh, is that um, here we are also ensuring that our design is behaving logically correct, but also in addition, it is not deviating from the uh, set functionality that was defined for this IP. So basically, in these two terms, we can say that your digital IP is actually verified completely. It is working fine uh, with respect to the functional requirements, and it is also not deviating from the any requirements that was uh, provided for this IP. So now the next question might arise that if uh, we have this IP, we have done so many checks and design, and it is anyways going to be integrated in SOC, then why don't we do this kind of verification at SOC? So we have uh, understood in last slides as well that it is not a very easy task to verify these IPs at SOC level because the debug at SOC is not that easy because in SOC you will be having number of IPs connected and uh, to verify or to validate a single IP at SOC level will be a huge task in terms of resource also in terms of timings also. So we are actually providing digital IP that is to be a bug free IP. And also, we are actually avoiding the uh, errors or the defects that can come across uh, at the SOC level. So, basically, we are left shifting all these stuff, all these uh, tasks at IP level so that we would be able to provide a standalone reusable IP to solve. That is a bug free IP and it is easy to reuse and pluggable. In this slide, you can also see that we are uh, talking about some parameters uh, and uh, Prabhjot also discussed about this thing that if we want to have a modular IP, then it should be a parameterizable IP where we can disable or enable some of the features of any IP and then we can use this IP at different SOC that are going to target the different applications. So the motto is provide a Clean, very, uh, clean IP to SOC to be integrated at SOC level. So here is the digital IP verification flow. So we were having digital uh, design uh, flow also, and now we will be discussing the IP verification flow, where the first step was the approved IP request. So what we uh, got here is, we got the number of requirements or these SOC requirements that were uh, a big level of requirement that what uh, this what our SOC is going to target as an application. 
So what we did with those requirements, we divided all those requirements at micro, macro level so that we can map all those requirements to different IP levels. So when they'll be connecting all these IPs within a SOC, they'll be targeting a specific application. So at that point of time, after we got the requirement, we uh, created the architectural definition also, like uh, what kind of design it would be, what kind of uh, state machine, what kind of ports, what kind of registers we'll be having for our IP. So that kind of like, architectural definition is also being increased. Now RTL design phase comes. So where RTL design is happening in parallel, we are also working on the verification strategy. So here you can see that we have two regimes, uh, verification and pre-silicon validation. So first I'll be taking you uh, guys with uh, verification strategy. So what we are targeting here is in verification strategy, we are uh, starting with the test plan. So we got the requirement. Now we also um, know that this kind of architectural definition would be. Now we'll be uh, defining the verification plan for that IP. So let's take an example of FIFO block. First in FIFO block, uh, first out FIFO block. So let's take few of the requirements like um, your FIFO is of the uh, depth size eight. And along with this, we are also uh, saying that uh, when we are reaching to the eight depth, we are going to send an interrupt to the outside world or it can be captured in your status. Other than that, when we are saying that these two are the requirements, we are also saying that when we are going beyond the depth eight, basically we are saying that we'll be uh, giving a status that there is an overflow error. Now, these are the three main requirements. So this is the part of our test plan. Now, the next step, uh, next step is test bench architecture or infrastructure identification or planning. So what are the major components of our test bench? The first component is test case, stimulus, or the input that you are going to provide to your DVD. Second component may be driver. Then you can have checkers, monitors, and scoreboards. So basically, uh, I'm taking here all these examples because uh, we are right now working on UVM. So these are the one, uh, one of the major component of uh, this kind of test bench architecture. So now you have plan, you have uh, structure ready. Now we are going to the next phase, that is the execution phase. So what we have done here is we have written a test case for FIFO depth 8 check. Okay, and we are actually driving some inputs to your duty which in turn getting uh, basically uh, your driver is uh, driving the duty with all these uh, inputs. And what is happening at the output of, of your duty, you are capturing all the outputs in monitor. And later, all these ports, all these outputs, all these status that you have captured in monitor, they are going to the scoreboard where you have written some checks or where you have set some rules that this kind of behavior will be coming. And this must be checked against the expected results. So this is basically the execution phase. So in execution phase, we have done simulation. So another strategy uh, we can also follow for, a, for the verification of our IP is formal. So basically we are going or we are following both the approaches, the dynamic simulation and the static simulation for the verification of our IP. So here the dynamic simulation is the basic simulation that we and that I have already described till now. If you are having a test case, you are driving your duty, you are getting some output and you are comparing the results. The another uh, flow is the formal. So formal is another approach where um, there are some specific set of rules that has been provided to the tool along with your design. So your tool is going to validate or is going to provide the inputs. Basically, you are not providing any test case in your formal. You are providing the design and the set of rules to formal and the input or the stimulus is getting driven from formal only. So that's how you are verifying or validating your IP against all those set rules. So now your plan is complete, your simulation is complete, your formal is also running in parallel. So basically, how and when you will be saying that, uh, yes, my IP verification is complete or my IP is ready to be integrated in SOC. So we do follow some set of matrix or sign off criteria like the coverage analysis, matrix collection and report generation. So here what we are targeting here is 
that your verification plan that you created is complete. Your all the test cases that you plan for your IP is being complete and they all pass it. Along with this, your code coverage is complete. The code coverage we are seeing uh, is referring to the RTL code. Basically, it is saying that each and every line or each piece of code that has been written in your RTL is being complete. It is getting fully exercised. All the ports that are coming out or in um, or the input of your IP are getting covered. They are toggling from zero to one and one to zero. And also you're seeing that all the expressions, all the condition that has been written in your uh, code is getting covered. The another type of uh, coverage analysis is the functional coverage. So the first that we talked about is code coverage that is actually covering your RTL is fully exercised or not. The another uh, coverage analysis is the functional coverage. This is user driven coverage. Basically, you are writing some kind of cover points around the feature of your IP, like your FIFO is getting to the depth of eight or not, whether you are getting uh, the interrupt on the um, on the um, overflow or on the reaching of when you are when your uh, FIFO depth is reaching to eight or not. So these kind of cover points you can add, uh, you can have an addition that can be covered in function coverage. So till now, the sign off criteria for IP verification is your verification plan is complete and passing. Your coverage analysis is 100% and you are done with this uh, verification. In parallel to design verification, we, we are uh, also having the pre-silicon validation that is that will go hand in hand with verification. So you can see here the term UTP that is basically connecting the design verification and the pre-silicon validation. So basically what we are doing here is we created a verification plan or we created a plan that what we are going to validate or verify for our IP. So there might be some test cases or some scenarios that you want to validate in verification and some of them cannot be validated in verification. So we'll be putting them to pre-silicon validation. So here comes the pre-silicon validation. What we actually do in pre-silicon validation. In pre-silicon validation, what we do is we actually map our IP to a FPGA platform. Our IP means the necklace of our IP is going to this FPGA prototype uh, platform. Here you can see that the red dotted module is the IP that we have developed and that's RTL verification or design verification is already done in parallel. Now this IP is getting connected with the real IPs or with the real system in real time scenario, where you can say that it will uh, how it will look like in real world when it will go to the SOC or subsystem. So you can compare it with the uh, design verification in a way that in our design verification you verified your RTL, but here and the, uh, there uh, with in RTL verification you were having some models those were dr driving your DOT and checking some uh, outputs but here your IP is connected with all the uh, different IPs that is that are supposed to be in a system so you can see that there uh, is a PC <coughs> it is getting connected to through uh, to your IP through PCI Express and some uh, high speed uh, serial interface also so the advantage of FPGA uh, prototype platform or the pre-silicon validation here is we are actually having some additional test cases that can be uh, developed for exactly the user case scenario. So this way, what we are achieving here is we are actually achieving the maturity of our IP. Like uh, we have the number of test cases in uh, digital IP verification, but here we are uh, generating the user case scenario. Other than that, the advantage of uh, pre-silicon is here we are actually seeing the simulation and uh, we are running the test cases in real time. So whatever test cases you were running in uh, IP verification, there might be uh, because uh, the CPU time was involved there or simulator time was also involved there. So a simulation that was targeted for let's say 20 microsecond, it might take one or two day in IP verification, but it might complete here in half an hour maybe. So this is the plus with pre-silicon validation. Plus we are also enabling our post-silicon validation team and the software development team that is going to uh, be coming uh, in further stages and we are enabling them 
while having this infrastructure ready in pre-silica. But now the question may I uh, may arise uh, in your mind that uh, when we are able to achieve so many things in pre-silicon validation, then why do we need the IP verification in parallel? So answer is we cannot debug any simulation in pre-silicon validation. That means we cannot see any waveform in pre-silicon validation. So we do need the uh, validation for uh, real uh, world scenarios. But in uh, parallel, we also need the IP verification system where we can easily debug the waveforms and we can see how our uh, design is working in actual. Also, here you can get the 100% coverage around the test plan, whatever test cases were targeted in pre-silicon validation, but you cannot converge the code coverage in pre-silicon validation. So this is how your FPGA system looks like. So for any IP to be completely signed off for SOC integration, we do have, we should uh, be able to complete this UTP or the test case plan should be complete 100% verified and this, these are passing along with the 100% co uh, code coverage that is coming out from the design verification and all the user scenarios that can be developed at the solution validation. So now let's move on to the digital IP portfolio examples. So uh, this is just an example that we usually have in uh, our organization. There are many other examples outside uh, our organization. So because we are actually working on automotive, so we do have uh, such portfolios and we categorized all these digital IPs in terms of the um, in terms of their usage or in terms of their application. So because we are part of automotive, so you can see that one of the categorization is falling in the vision, graphics, radar IPs. So the IPs that we are targeting uh, here are vision accelerator, signal processor, graphic accelerator, and also some of the communication IP you must have heard. All these IPs in your uh, curriculum also like uh, USB, Ethernet, DDR, some infrastructure IPs that are the basically big backbone of for any kind of SOC because clock and reset controller are always needed for shocks. Other uh, some some other IPs are uh, that are basic, basically targeted for uh, um, automotive products are uh, intelligent timers, audio IPs, and all. Nowadays we are also working in say uh, safety and security uh, features as well. So there are number of IPs that we are targeting with uh, this categorization like encryption, decryption, decryption and uh, security engine. We are also working in core and platforms also. So with this, we can conclude that our motto is uh, for any design, whether it, it is IP or whether it is a SOC, it should be zero defect and first time right. Because um, IP is the basic uh, main building block of any SOC. So anyways, if you are going to have uh, a defect in IP that is going to be uh, contributing to the SOC defect also. So we don't want that kind of thing to happen at any application. So the target is the zero defect and first time right. So these are the basic pillars that our organization or IP team is working on. That is the functionality, area, power, performance, and DFT. Along with the, we are creating some differentiation um, in respect, uh, with respect to the features that we are delivering to SOC. And while maintaining the execution, that to be uh, simple, and we are also heading to the uh, guidelines and flows that we must follow for any kind of execution. And yes, the thing that is to be remembered uh, is the quality on focus. So this is the kind of attitude that we are working on. If you have any question uh, further, you may ask anything and we would try uh, our level best to answer your queries. Thank you so much.